All right, hello everyone. How you doing? Um, in the interest of time, let's let's get into it. So my name is Mark Bray. I teach European history at Rutgers, and I'm chairing this wonderful panel today. Um, let me just introduce the first speaker. Uh, Nigel Copsey is a professor of modern history and director of the Center for Fascist, Anti-Fascist, and Post-Fascist Studies at the University of Teesside, UK. He is the author of Anti-Fascism in Britain, Contemporary British Fascism, the British National Party, and the Quest for Legitimacy, co-editor of British Fascism, the Labor Movement, and the State, co-editor of Varieties of Anti-Fascism, co-editor of BNP Contemporary Perspectives, editor of the journal Fascism, and co-editor of the Rutledge Studies in Fascism, the far-right series among, you get the idea, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's great. His work's amazing, so let me hand it over. Thanks very much uh, for that introduction, Mark. It's, um, I'm obviously delighted to be here. It gives me the opportunity to say "quaffy." You know, it's uh, people thinking I'm a bit weird. "Quaffy," is it? "Quaffy," "Quaffy," "Quaffy." Not "qua." No, it's coffee. It's coffee. It's coffee. <laughs> right. So. Desktop. Right. Okay. Back. This one? And will be two, yeah? Okay, so panel four, you're inside panel two. Is this you? Uh, no. Uh, then I don't know where you are. Okay, so panel. Uh, okay. Good. This is why. This is why you should bring the stick drive. Okay, so the title of my paper then is uh, New Times, New Challenges on Mobilising and Organising Against Fascism in the 21st Century. Right, so by way of introduction then. The radical right uh, populist surge so, uh, shows no sign of abating. In September, the Swedish Democrats, who with roots in Swedish fascism, became the country's second largest party. Uh, while in Italy, the Brothers of Italy, a neo-fascist inspired formation emerged triumphant in the general election. Yet this electoral surge and the resulting institutionalization of radical right populists is not a new phenomenon. If the financial crash of 2008 accelerated, uh, accelerated it, the origins stretch further back. They actually go back to uh, the 1980s and Jean-Marie Le Pen's National Front in France. So for anti-fascists, therefore, the strategic problem of confronting adversaries that have become part of the mainstream, that have become part of mainstream institutionalized politics is a long-standing one. Now, given such a problem, anti-fascist street activists have generally restricted their street activi activity to confronting groups of overt extra-parliamentary right-wing extremists. This made sense in the late 20th century when your archetypal right-wing extremist was a white power skinhead, uh, but in the 21st century, the extra-parliamentary far right uh, often presents in a different aesthetic the far right today appropriates, often appropriates the language of anti-fascism, of anti-racism, of human rights, of free speech, and the oppressed. 
So the former uh, English Defence League leader Tommy Robinson, uh, a poster boy of Britain's far right, uh, projected himself as a free speech martyr. Many drawn to this protest, to his protest on Britain's streets, uh, eschewed fascism. Many did not recognise uh, their protest as racism. And of course, in the US, as we've seen, as anti fascists organised against uh, the white supremacist Proud Boys, they encountered a leader, Enrico Tario, an Afro Cuban, uh, who denounced anti Semitism, racism, and fascism. So my question uh, is basically what happens when the extra-parliamentary right wing, uh, when extra-parliamentary right wing extremists mobilize in a form which is not ostensibly fascist? And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to two uh, examples. The first comes from my own country, Britain, which concerns how anti-fascists responded to novel forms of anti-Muslim street protest. The second comes from Canada and concerns the ways in which anti-fascists responded to the so-called Freedom Convoy, uh, which claimed to defend, to defend values of liberty, of sovereignty, of justice, and of truth. So in both cases, then, I want to address, look at the key challenges that anti-fascists had to negotiate. So I want to begin with Britain. So in the first decade of the 21st century, the militant wing of the British anti-fascist movement was of minimal significance. Numbers probably never exceeded more than a few hundred. And there were two key factors that account for this. The first was that the British far right had removed the opportunity for physical confrontation by abandoning the streets and renouncing uh, its traditional march and growth strategy. The second factor was, that, was the electoral rise of the British National Party. Now, as the British National Party began to, uh, begun to win uh, local council uh, seats and became institutionalized at local level, so anti-fascists deployed non-violent uh, interventions designed to maximize the turnout of the anti-BMP vote. But this had the effect of marginalizing militant anti-fascism. So at the very moment when militant anti-fascism was at its lowest ebb, a new form of anti-Muslim street protest emerges in Britain in the guise of the English Defence League, or EDL. The EDL, which first appeared in 2009, posed a qualitatively different challenge, for unlike the BMP, the EDL did not contest elections. What's more, the EDL projected itself as a liberal, non-racist, anti-homophobic human rights organization that was concerned not with race, but with opposition to Islam. So the EDL was genuinely novel. It emerges from a working class culture based not on the traditional far right, but on football lads. For those of you unfamiliar with this term, I'm talking about a subsection of uh, football, or as you call it over here, soccer culture, that is typified by hooliganism, the wearing of expensive designer clothing, the likes of uh, Stone Island, Burberry scarves, and so on. Forming part of a wider counter-jihad movement, the EDL was therefore ostensibly non-fascist. It was not uncommon for the Israeli flag to be brandished at EDL demonstrations. The EDL established its own Jewish defense, uh, Jewish division, uh, alongside dedicated divisions for Sikhs and Hindus. And there was a, also a division for the LGBT community as well. So how did anti-fascists respond to opponents who did not arrive, you know, waving white power banners? Now, militant anti-fascist practice in Britain had long responded to the far right through so-called squadism. Uh, this is where you had uh, a practice, really, of small squads of militant anti-fascists engaging in direct physical confrontation with small numbers of fascists. As a tactic, it was pretty effective. It was effective when the fascist numbers were small and when the targets were at their most uh, vulnerable. <coughs> 
But after 2009, anti-fascists had to confront up to 2,000 or so EDL supporters on Britain's streets. And what they now confronted was not some small white supremacist street militia, but an English working class culture rooted in casual clothing, football, and Churchillian patriotism. Now, the only anti-fascist organization with the capacity to respond at this particular moment was an organization called Unite Against Fascism. But its counter-demonstrations were increasingly rendered into static protests. There was little possibility of direct action. Unite Against Fascism labeled the EDL Nazi and fascist even when most EDL supporters remained adamant that they were not racist, let alone fascist. The EDL countered that it was open to all people, regardless of color, ethnicity, and sexuality. And the EDL was a single issue organization protesting Islam as a religion and not as skin color. The EDL responded to anti-fascists through a strategy of inversion. Their left-wing opponents they were the real fascists because they were the ones that denied free speech. Now, in 2011, a militant uh, alternative to Unite Against Fascism uh, emerges in the form of the Anti-Fascist Network, uh, which was a network of local militant anti-fascists which increasingly understood the EDL as, as part of a broader counter-jihad new right uh, that had ditched many symbols and preoccupations of the traditional far right. And there was also increasing recognition amongst militant anti-fascists that their toolkit had to adapt. Effective anti-fascism had to become more inclusive. It had to mobilize larger numbers of people through broader, less threatening local campaigns. Unfortunately for anti-fascists, because it increasingly attracted an extremist fringe, the EDL struggled to control its own anti-racist message. Before long, the EDL was offering a safe space for extremists, and this meant that anti-fascists, while still acknowledging the EDL did not sit within the kind of classic fascist profile, could now begin to define the EDL as proto-fascist. And this was given further credibility when Tommy Robinson quit the EDL, citing his concerns over the dangers of, of far-right extremism. Uh, and without their talisman, the EDL went into a downward spiral. Now, this was not the end of the story, because several years later, Tommy Robinson uh, returned to the front lines. Um, and he was, at that time, he was capitalizing on his um, arrest and detention in jail for contempt of court. There were a series of free Tommy demonstrations that took place in London in June 2018 in the largest far-right demonstration in Britain since the 1930s. About 10,000, even up to 15,000 or so of his supporters uh, demonstrated calling for Tommy's release. The number was three times the number of any EDL demonstration, and not surprisingly, this sent a shockwave amongst anti-fascists. But the support base for Tommy was still a heavily personalized response that traded on Robinson's celebrity and narrative of victimhood. The vast majority of those attending the Free Dems Tommy demonstrations, even if they were Islamophobic to the core, were not ideologically committed fascists. And significantly, militant anti-fascists still demurred from labeling, labeling Robinson a fascist. They stressed that the Free Tommy movement offered a safe space for these more extreme elements of the far right to kind of normalize themselves and to recruit. And anti-fascists could still kind of frame the far right as a threat that was becoming ever more dangerous, as a site for potential radicalization. And in the end, the response seems to have been affected by the end of 2018 or so. The numbers on counter demonstrations were outnumbering those of the far right. And then in 2019, uh, Robinson was deplatformed from social media. He was banned from Facebook, uh, his primary means of communication. The bubble burst, basically. And after that came the pandemic. Now, across this side of the Atlantic, Canada also had its own pre-pandemic history of anti-Muslim street protest. This dates from 20, late 2016, when motion M103, a motion condemning Islamophobia, was passed in the Canadian Parliament. 
M103 galvanised far-right opposition, but as in Britain, this was not explicitly neo-Nazi. Now, to begin with, anti-Muslim street protests drew support from a diverse spectrum, including uh, Indian-origin Hindu nationalists and the Jewish Defence League, before groups like the Proud Boys and the Soldiers of Odin uh, came more to the fore. Yet even at its peak, the Canadian Islamophobic street movement struggled to mobilise in equivalent numbers to their counterparts in Britain. In Toronto, for example, the low hundreds was pretty typical, although the Francophone uh, far right in Quebec could mobilise significantly more. Now, come the pandemic, and with the left-wing activist network sorely depleted through social distancing and so on, it's hardly surprising that anti-fascists really felt overwhelmed when the Freedom Convoy uh, arrived in downtown Ottawa in January 2022. 20, uh, now, as a form of protest, a trucker convoy to Ottawa had been tried before in 2019, but this was protesting uh, Trudeau's environmental policies. This time around, although ostensibly a protest at vaccine mandates, as it made its slow roll towards the capital, the convoy morphed into libertarian calls for freedom from the tyranny of the Trudeau government. And one of the key organisers of this was a guy called Patrick King, who was a far-right conspiracy theorist uh, with about 300,000 or so followers on Facebook. Now, that tr truck a convoy in 2019, when it first been tried, had been in Ottawa for a day or so. This time around, it occupied the downtown core area for three weeks. It also drew in support from thousands of people, if not tens of thousands. Although the main organizers of the convoy are clear ties to the far right, it all took, takes place under the banner of freedom, not fascism. The atmosphere and convoy land in the downtown was described as more akin to a festive party than an insurrectionary protest with music, bouncy castles, and even a hot tub. And yet more than 400 hate incidents were reported to Ottawa police. So how did anti-fascists respond? Well, the militant anti-fascist group in Ottawa, a group called Ottawa Against Fascism, part of a city-by-city city network, uh, which had been originally established by the Revolutionary Communist Party, had long since imploded. Uh, there were a small group number of anarchists, uh, but very few. So once it became clear that the convoy was sticking around, and this despite temperatures of something like minus 20, hardy souls, of course, uh, in, in Canada, it fell to the progressive wing of the labor unions to push back. And a key organization in setting this in motion was uh, the Public Service Alliance of Canada. Conversations between it and community activists and residents led to uh, the formation of an organization called Community Solidarity Ottawa, um, the idea behind the uh, CSO was to embed the response to the convoy within the community and to frame it not in the context of anti-fascism, but in the context of the pandemic. Now, the CSO called for public health measures to protect communities, gave expressions of support to front frontline public service workers. Tellingly, while there was a call for an end to the occupation, this call was framed in terms of defending communities against forms of harassment that the convoy had directed toward downtown residents uh, with reports of non-white residents being subject to racial harassment. Anti-racism featured strongly, but there was little recourse to anti-fascism. CSO was not an explicit anti-fascist group. So about two weeks after the convoy had arrived, the CSO sponsored a counter-protest. It involved uh, about several thousand people marching in a peripheral loop around the downtown core. The march deliberately avoided direct confrontation with the convoy. A significant number of counter-protest organizers had received training in de-escalation tactics. And this was more about confidence building than anything else. Yet, and, and emboldened by this display, the following day on the 13th of February, protests turned to direct action. On hearing news that a contingent of 30 or so convoy support vehicles would be driving into the downtown from one of the major supply points, a spontaneous call went out to organize a temporary blockade. Word spread across social media, including uh, amongst the dog walkers group, which you know is hardly a black block, right? Now, while at least uh, three blockades happen, happened simultaneously, by far the largest occurred at Billings Bridge, 
Here there were reports of up to 1,000 counter-protesters kettling 30 pickup trucks. The blockade lasted till the evening. Locked-in vehicles were finally released one by one, but only when they had removed their Canadian flags and jerry cans of fuel. And this episode was later dubbed the Battle of Billings Bridge. Now, in the history of anti-fascism, of course, whenever reference to a battle is made, it's usually in connection with violent confrontation. This was not violent, right? The battle was a met uh, metaphorical one. The interaction between protesters and convoy participants, whilst tense and it could be sometimes angry, involved a series of conversations. Since many of the convoy participants did not self-identify as far right and aligned themselves to patriotic conceptions of liberty and freedom, anti-fascism hardly functioned as a, as a core narrative. Instead, there was mutual recognition of the convoy's legitimate anger at the Trudeau government, uh, about the handling of the pandemic and so on, and counter-protesters advocated, what they advocated really was for a, an anti-racist, socially progressive alternative to the convoy's conspiracy-ridden uh, rhetoric. Billings Bridge was a small victory. In the end, of course, what did for the convoy occupation was the uh, Trudeau government invoking the Emergencies Act. Conclusion. In the late 20th century, then, sorry, in the late 20th, yeah, in the late 20th century, when taking to the streets, uh, skinhead stormtroopers of the master race typically stood out, right? Um, they did not hide their claims to white supremacy. In the 21st century, the times seem to have changed. As we have seen from Britain and Canada, the far right often propagates the language of freedom. It presents in the name of the oppressed as the victim of discrimination. Its articulation of racism is often, quote, liberal. So much so that it can, as in the case of Canada, find support from within the conservative mainstream. Recalibrating counter-narratives and counter-protests to a context where the far right now frames itself as non-racist and liberal necessitates a, more bro a broader, more inclusive, more imaginative, more nuanced response. And this logic extends to online spaces too. I don't have time to speak about this, but online anti-fascists were effective in jamming the Freedom Convoy's communication tools with Ram Ranch, which was a 2012, I found out, porno metal song. Comedy gold, as one online activist described it. Thanks. All right, thank you for that interesting presentation. Let's move on to the next one. Um, Stanislav Vysotsky is an associate professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of the Fraser Valley in British Columbia, Canada. Dr. Vysotsky's research focuses on the militant anti-fascist movement and the relationship between threat, space, subculture, and social movement activism. He is the author of American Antifa, The Tactics, Culture, and Practice of Militant Anti-Fascism, which you should all pick up, and has published research on fascist and supremacist movements in a variety of journals. Thank you. Yeah, adjust this for short guy. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to do something a little bit different. Typically, I do a little bit more of a talk and traditional PowerPoint. But uh, I thought with this to uh, kind of go with my background in the anarchist punk scene that brought me to anti-fascism, uh, which often had more of a kind of visual element uh, going with the musical presentations. So you get more of a visual element while I read a very boring paper. Um, so imagine some really like terrible discordant music as background to all of this and uh, we'll just go and hopefully this thing will work in the timings. Right, so <clears throat> the willingness to engage in violence against the far right is arguably the most controversial aspect of anti-fascist activism. 
Militant anti-fascism is defined specifically by activist support for the use of force against individuals affiliated with fascist movements. Yet it is precisely this willingness to engage in confrontational and violent clashes with the far right that draws the greatest criticisms of Antifa activism. Far right activists have tried with varying degrees of success to paint anti-fascist use of force as an attack on their right to free speech and free assembly that ultimately morphed into a narrative of the Antifa activist as mindlessly violent lawbreaker a frame that was successfully laundered into mainstream conservative discourse and fueled the construction of a moral panic around quote-unquote Antifa violence and anarchist jurisdictions during the racial justice protests of 2020. Part of this narrative was also picked up by credulous liberals who viewed anti-fascist activists as illiberal actors engaging in undemocratic activity and stifling the mythical marketplace of ideas. Calls to label Antifa a terrorist organization or criminal gang became the common response following high-profile clashes between Antifa activists and the far right. For liberal critics of Antifa militancy, the response to fascist violence or threats is to rely on institutions of the society designed to maintain peace and social order, namely the police and criminal justice system. Even in the most ideal situations where law enforcement and the courts do in fact intercede against fascists, the reliance on such institutions serves as a means of outsourcing violence uh, <clears throat> rather than a position of nonviolence. Implicit in this position is an understanding that the threat of fascist violence must be addressed through some sort of use of force, but only the force of the state is legitimate based on its assertion of a monopoly on that power. In essence, the liberal position on anti-fascism is that violence is acceptable as long as it is the violence of the state and its institutions, not the violence of the people directly affected by fascist mobilization. Militant anti-fascism, therefore, represents a distinct rejection of this position. Aside from the strategic effectiveness of violence deployed by a counter-movement demo to demobilize its opposition, anti-fascist use of force serves ideological and practical functions. Contemporary militant anti-fascism, particularly in North America, is rooted in an anti-authoritarian, if not explicitly anarchist, ideology. For Antifa activists, the authoritarian ideology of fascism represents the ultimate form of domination because it is predicated on the belief of inherent biological and social inequality enforced through violence. It is therefore ideologically imperative for contemporary anti-fascists as anti-authoritarians to oppose the resurgent far right. Additionally, Antifa activists reject the legitimacy of the state as the sole actor in maintaining safe, safety and social order, as well as its claim to a monopoly on the use of force. For anti-fascist activists, the use of force serves as both an assertion of autonomy and prefigurative ideological practice. As a practical concern, militancy is a direct response to the threat of fascist violence against people and places that comes out of practical necessity. Anti-fascists recognize the distinct threat posed by the far right because of their direct experiences with fascist violence, either as a result of their historically and systemically marginalized identity or spatial proximity in subcultural or social settings. For these activists, violent opposition to fascism is a means of survival in addition to an ideological concern. The use of force by militant anti-fascists, therefore, serves as a means of asserting self-defense against an existential threat. Rather than relying on the state to intervene to defend themselves and their communities by outsourcing the use of violence, Antifa activists insource violence as a means of exerting their autonomy and practical means of defense. Anarchists have taken varying positions on the use of violence as a tactic since the movement's formation in the late, uh, sorry, formalization in the late 19th century. While some have advocated a strictly pacifist position as a rejection of the values and practices of hierarchical society, others have advocated for its necessity as quote-unquote propaganda by deed. While pacifism came to dominate anarchist discourse in the mid-20th century, the contemporary movement generally embraces a militancy which argues that confrontation and resistance require some, use, some form of use of force. In some cases, arguments have been made that acts of property destruction and even anti-fascist conflict are not forms of violence per se because they pale in comparison to the violence of capital, the state, and fascism. 
Such a position was common among the anti-fascists whom I interviewed and observed. Virtually all the anti-fascists with whom I had contact self-identified as anarchists. As such, they rejected the dominant narrative of protest in contemporary liberal democratic societies that stresses non-confrontational protest and petition of grievances to the state. Rather, they advocated for a radical form of self-determination that involved the reorganization of social institutions into non-hierarchical forms. For these activists, anti-fascism was a means of ensuring the defeat of fascism through their self-activity instead of appeals to the repression of the state. Several formal interview participants explicitly distinguished their militant anti-fascism from that of mainstream watchdog groups such as the Southern Poverty Law Center and Anti-Defamation League by their willingness to personally act against the far right instead of relying on police to demobilize the movement through legal means. This anarchist or anti-authoritarian take on anti-fascism has its roots in the subcultural form of contemporary anti-activism. As fascist movements shifted their recruitment strategies toward nascent punk and skinhead subcultures in the 70s and 80s, resistance to the far right took on a more subcultural rather than ideological tone. Where anti-fascism was the stuff of the organized left with strong ties to socialist and communist parties, the subcultural terrain created a more diffuse and decentralized form of resistance to fascism. This diffusion coupled with an oppositional politics rooted in anarchist influence principles rejected normative approaches to confronting fascism. So while the oppositional politics of what Mark Ham refers to as fuck youism drew fascist affiliated skinheads into the subculture, they also rejected the reliance on the state and other forms of authority as a means to resist far right infiltration and takeover. The do-it-yourself ethos of these subcultural forms also served as an anti-authoritarian means of organizing resistance against fascism. <clears throat> Since many punk events were self-organized by participants in venues outside of normal spaces of music and leisure, there were few formal channels to rely upon when fascists appeared. Punk anti-fascism had to be as DIY as the events that it was serving to protect with show attendees taking it upon themselves to eject fascist attendees and troublemakers because bouncers and police were neither present nor reliable sources of protection. So while not necessarily explicitly ideological, this form of subcultural activism took on many of the characteristics of anarchist models of organization, namely spontaneity and direct action. As anti-fascist activism became part of the subculture, it was embraced in its cultural practices through music, literature, and style. Whether ideological, subcultural, pragmatic, or both, militant anti-fascism consistently rejects the necessity and legitimacy of the state as an intervening actor in the fight against fascism. Antifa activists recognize that, <coughs> recognize that the left poses a greater threat to the legitimacy and structure of existing society than fascism. In this sense, the street violence of fascist movements is frequently viewed as a bulwark against the organization and mobilization of leftist forces in those societies. While the members of fascist movements may be crude in their politics and their politics distasteful to liberal sensibilities, they serve the practical function of repressing popular social movements of the left and create a pole of recruitment for factions of the alienated working class and downwardly mobile middle class. As such, the state will protect fascist violence as a corollary to the quote unquote violent left subcultural gang warfare or other forms of false equivalence that minimize the danger of the far right and exaggerate that of the left. The forces of the state that serve as the operational arm of its monopoly on violence, namely the police, are also frequently complicit in fascist violence. Police officers and leadership routinely express sympathy for the far right in explicit and implicit ways. In North America, rank and file officers routinely express the kind of virulent racism, misogyny, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, and other biases that are at the core of fascist ideology. Police officers share and amplify far-right narratives about quote-unquote dangerous protesters that culminated in numerous departments issuing warnings of supposed Antifa buses of out-of-state activists descending on small towns throughout the United States at the peak of racial justice protests in the summer of 2020. These beliefs and practices are coupled with a general authoritarianism and disdain for the public that is intrinsic to police culture. As anti-fascist research and doxing efforts have indicated, the practice of active duty police and military participation in or association with fascist organizations continues to be a common occurrence that rarely results in any serious consequences for those found to be active with the far right. 
Even when these agents of the state are not active members of fascist groups, they frequently build friendly relationships with them and engage in active collusion. This dynamic came to light in dramatic fashion in Portland, where a protest liaison officer exchanged friendly text messages with the leader of the far-right group Patriot Prayer, including providing logistical information that allowed its members and supporters to evade arrest. In a separate incident, Portland police allowed far-right activists to dismantle a sniper nest that was set up aiming at anti-fascist counter-protesters without facing any arrest, detention, or reprimand. They were simply let go and allowed to join their uh, compatriots in the street protests. <clears throat> in the context of these dynamics, it is little wonder that, the, that anti-fascist activists do not rely on cops or courts to do the work for them, to paraphrase the point of unity of the Torch Antifa network. Antifa activists, therefore, take on the role of defending their communities themselves from the threats posed by fascists. Fascists pose a direct threat to marginalized communities, oppositional subcultures, and leftist movements, of, all of whom have little confidence in the effectiveness of police protection. Anti-fascist mobilization serves as a direct means to confront that threat in a practical manner. Even if police weren't actively sympathetic to or in collusion with elements of the far right, the practice of policing is one of responding to incidents after the fact, rather than of proactive protection of vulnerable people. In protest scenarios, police are frequently deployed as a protective cordon around the fascists who are asserting their right to demonstrate, which places their attention and repressive capacities on anti-fascist counter-protesters. In subcultural spaces that have served as the heart of anti-fascism for slightly more than three decades, attempting to rely on police to rid a space of fascist interlopers brings risks of ending events early, losing underground venue, and even arrest of attendees. Where law enforcement is ineffective and outright hostile to the people directly impacted by fascist mobilization and violence, Antifa activism, including the use of force, becomes a means of ensuring defense. Militant anti-fascism, whether formally organized and well-planned, or informal and completely spontaneous, is both pragmatic and ideologically consistent. When faced with the immediate threat of fascist violence, anti-fascist counter-violence serves to demobilize that threat and cause damage to fascist movement and its members, two key elements of counter-movement dynamic. By ejecting fascists from a space as small as an underground venue or as large as a city, Antifa activists reduce the active threat posed by fascists in a manner that supersedes the authority of the state. In this sense, anti-fascists take back the claim to legitimate use of force from the state and quote unquote in-source violence by distributing power to use protective force back to ordinary people. In this sense, I, as I've noted elsewhere, anti-fascism serves to prefigure a model of community self-defense that reflects several basic tenets of anarchism, spontaneity, non-hierarchical organization, and direct democracy. For anti-fascists, the use of violence becomes the means to stop fascist violence because the, the state cannot and will not do so. That's it. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, really unusual and fun presentation. <clears throat> Our next presenter is James Tracy, who is a professor in the political science department at San Francisco State University and a Bay Area author and organizer. Um, he brings 30 years of experience in the politics of housing, economic justice, and social movements to the classroom. Tracy is the co-author of Hillbilly Nationalists, Urban Race Rebels, and Black Power, Interracial Solidarity in the 1960s, 70s, New Left Organizing, No Fascist USA, which I think is available on the back, but, but check it out, great book, um, about uh, the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and Lessons for Today's Movements. He's the author of Dispatches Against Displacement, Field Notes from San Francisco's Housing Wars. His articles have appeared in Shelter Force, Race, Poverty, and the Environment, the Italian American Review, and other venues. Uh, he is the chair of Labor and Community Studies Department at City College of San Francisco. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to uh, all the staff here at Hofstra for your labor for making this happen and all the students uh, that are here and everybody who has traveled. I'll get one thing out of the way. Uh, right off the bat, all of the panelists met and we got the same haircut uh, <laughs> right before. 
We tried to jump Mark and take and um, and give it, give his head a shave, but uh, he resisted. So um, I'm here to talk about the John Brown Anti Klan Committee. Uh, that was uh, a small but incredibly influential group in the 70s and 80s. So where I grew up in Vallejo, California, which is the most diverse uh, city in the West Coast, and prob uh, probably, uh, as far as uh, suburbs go, probably the most working class one in the 80s. It was a wonderful time. Uh, lots of, you know, my town uh, developed much uh, you know, so really strong youth subcultures, both hip hop and, and punk rock. Good time to uh, to grow up up until the uh, deindustrialization hit us, and with deindustrialization and kind of the elimination of good jobs, we also had this little thing called skinheads, Nazi skinheads, not the good skinheads, that came uh, came to town and tried to convince us uh, white identified folks to betray our lifelong friendships with our. Uh, uh, you know, with our friends of color and go go become Nazis. Uh, there was a, uh, a concert concert called Aryan Woodstock that uh, the Nazis, white Aryan resistance and those assorted other boneheads tried to uh, organize uh, right on on the outskirts uh, there and that's where this this photo was uh, was t taken from. So that's where I first met the John Brown anti clan Committee because they were doing what good Marxist Leninists do is they stand on corners and they sell newspapers, right? So. Uh, that's something that uh, and they do do so much more as I'm going to talk about. But they were, uh, you know, selling a paper. I think that they had uh, by that time they had um, it had had adopted the title for their newspaper. It had changed a few times to the very conservative "Death to the Clan." Uh, that's cool, you know. And uh, you know, it, it, what was what was really remarkable is that there were people that were actually out there on the corner having those uh, conversations about go this way, right? Uh, your future is in, is, is in solidarity with your bro brothers and sisters ac across the color line. It's not, uh, it's not with these white Aryan resistance uh, groups and assorted other uh, tr uh, troublemakers that were uh, trying to destroy our town. Uh, the concert completely fizzled out uh, wonderfully, and there was lots of, lots of good counter, counter mobilizations, not just from John Brown anti clan Committee, but lots of our local, uh, local churches and stuff I remember my mother taking, uh, taking me to one of my first demonstrations there. So I talk about that because it's the context of the 80s, right? And uh, I'm gonna probably hit on what I call the MSNBC thesis. Uh, the MSNBC thesis being that all of our troubles started in 2016, which I don't think anybody in this room probably shares, but it's an incredibly powerful narrative that uh, there were good Republicans, right? You know that um, that Reagan, you know Reagan was a good, responsible Republican because he didn't uh, he didn't actually call for the assassination of uh, of his of his opposition. No, Ronald Reagan was a direct, very polite uh, response to uh, you know, to you know, to white supremacy. It was the the white uh, his 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 administration. Was the main was part of the mainstreaming of the of, of the street violence that we, that we were we were seeing. He uh, he had the the full endorsement of the Ku Klux Klan at the time. So in 19, uh, 1977, you have a group of activists not not for, far from here that were all new left activists that had gone you know mostly white but not all gone through supporting the civil rights movement, gone through supporting the black pow black power movement, and gone through seeing. Their comrades going to prison for political activities, right? So, uh, as the new left, uh, and, uh, the optimism of the new, the new left started to uh, to wane, people were dealing with new realities of just friends and comrades being in prison. How do you support your friends that are lo uh, that are locked up? And as part of this dialogue uh, that was going on, uh, the lines between political prisoner and social prisoner started to blur. They were always blurred, but you know. Uh, Blurred, they you're practi practically non-existent, but there were definitely at that point within the left was a bigger, di bigger distinction. Uh, a man um, named Kalio uh, Sinato Hadari wrote a letter to the outside groups, uh, alerting them to the fact that there were active clan caverns in every single last jail and prison in upstate New York, and uh, groups like the Inside Outside a Coalition and then the John Brown Book Club responded and started going out, taking the responsibility as mostly white people to go out and talk to mostly white people about what was going on. 
and to uh, call for investigations, call for firings, things like this. It was long before the internet, right? You couldn't cancel somebody. You actually had to go out to Safeway and go talk to talk to people, sign this uh, sign this petition. So uh, the uh, these groups that you know all you know at this point had you know fair you know parts of what we call the new common. Uh, communist movement associated with groups like Perry Fire Organizing Committee, May 19th communist uh, organizations that people could write full on books. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready for it. Uh, probably 400 page uh, books about their complicated histories. Um, they had already been influenced by the discourse on fascism coming out of the 60s, right? Their, their uh, Black Panther Party uh, comrades had actually sponsored the United Front Against Fascism conference in Oakland, California. George Jackson's beautiful uh, exhortations uh, to ask people to unite against fascism were already part of that. Fred Hampton and certainly Asada Shakur had already started to formulate kind of a black power for, uh, understanding of, uh, of fascism, which these comrades also also took to uh, uh, took, took to heart. So. In court of this was the idea of decolonization, trying to link the larger decolonization di uh, dialogues to what, what, what was going on here, sometimes very successfully, sometimes, le uh, sometimes less so, right? If you look at their, their uh, primary documents, uh, oftentimes uh, you know, their pamphlets were, were quite good and actually made, made the connections. Uh, a lot of their handbills looked like a, just kind of like a grocery list, like, in, you know, confront the flag and support South Africa and do this and do this and everything. But there was this attempt at trying to bring together the local and the international uh, organizing. One of the key things about John Brown Anti-Klan Committee that uh, I think was very important and also really relevant to today uh, is the up south. They really embraced the idea of up the up south uh, thesis that I, I believe, uh, believe was first kind of articulated by Malcolm X really looking for the way in northern cities perpetuated white supremacy and um, not, you know, in, in Oakland and San Francisco where mostly uh, see the expressions of white supremacy through the planning codes and rent, you know, and the housing question. Uh, but they were also calling out, like, yeah, you know what, there's, there's, there's Klan in your neighborhood too, right? In Brooklyn, uh, you know, there was, there was a spate of at least 50, uh, uh, incidents of ra racial violence in about 80, 81, targeting um, targeting mostly black people, um, not not all. Certainly, along with that was you know homophobic attacks, and they found that they were increase increasingly connected. So, calling out the northern cities for their complicity and not giving nor northern liberals a um, you you know kind of like that ide ideological. Um, Way out of thinking that that's all that's going down in Georgia, right? You know, racism's a South thing. No, I was like, no, this this is up South, and they had uh, had had plenty of uh, plenty of campaigns that illustrated this, especially when uh, Cooney, out here, City University of New York, had an open uh, shifted to an open admission uh, policy, and um, white people organized to shut that down, right? And we, it's the same rhetoric that we hear: they letting the unqualified in. Um, all of that, uh, those you know, racist co code words, and they went out, and they would uh, John Brown Anti Klan Committee would go out and counter demonstrate and use this as a as as a way of talking with Black and Puerto Rican uh, students and making coalition. So, one thing that I think uh, one through line through all of our our work is the importance of music. So today's far right. Uh, you know, music is just kind of one uh, one piece of kind of like their cultural uh, toolbox, right? They've got got video games. They have you know Reddit threads for uh, for uh, for forever. Um, you know, right wing sports uh, sport, sports clubs, especially on on the on the on the West Coast. You could almost say that uh, to you know in the eighties and up to today, the right's better. You know, does better Gromsky than uh, than the left. Right, I mean, they uh, they they truly under understand this. John Brown Anti Klan Committee were very very inspired as I was by our British uh, Rock Against Racism and Anti Nazi Nazi League, and started to participate in things like Rock Against Race Racism uh, 
movements, but calling it Rock, Rock Against Reagan movement. And they certainly, John Brown Anti-Klan Committee weren't the only force uh, uh, force organizing this, uh, bringing together groups like the Dead Kennedys, uh, rest in peace, D.H. Peligro, who just uh, passed away this uh, this week, my good friend Der uh, Gary Floyd, pro uh, probably the best uh, anti-fascist poet in, uh, in the world who wrote such conservative songs such as uh, Hate the Police and uh, George Jackson, things like that, and really looking at ways of intervening in culture because if you look at punk rock, punk rock has always been contested territory, right? And that was largely the fault of people uh, doing what we would call today edgelord behavior, right? You know, Susie and the Banshees. I don't believe that Susie and the Banshees were ever fascists or that, uh, you know, Sid Vicious actually really gave, uh, gave a damn about Hitler or anything like that. But playing around with Nazi imagery definitely gave the, uh, the signal that, you know, say, hey, hey, you know, you guys can come on in here and do some recruitment. So they went to the shows. They, organ uh, they, uh, they organized informa information tables and really taking uh, counterculture very, very seriously as a way of reaching angry young, uh, young white people and bringing them in the, uh, in the direction of anti-racist, anti-fascist uh, sol solidarity. Uh, one, you know, one interesting intervention in culture comes out as outside of the musical world. Uh, those of us of a certain age would, will remember the very famous Oprah Winfrey episode where she did the very smart thing of having a bunch of Nazi skinheads on her show. Um, I hope they fired the producer <laughs> because, but the um, John Brown Anti-Klan Committee went out and found anti-racist skinheads to get into the audience and intervene in that in that conversation, and you know that was not a comfortable space for most people on the left to be in to like go and talk to anti-racist skinheads that aren't exactly the most politically correct people. Like you know. Uh, uh, and you know they could be very anti-racist and completely homophobic, completely, uh, uh, com completely violent, completely sexist. But they were out there having the conversations with with these people and saying, you know what, we got to get we we got to get down. In conclusion, I think the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee were the most successful when they learned how to uh, how to work with others. Right? So there was a time in their development uh, you know all over i think they had about 15 chapters nationwide small you know small collectives probably the first group that was technically a front group of two different communist organizations but that's a whole other story um, when they stopped making demands like you know coming you know coming into this space coming into anti-fascism you had to have a checklist you had to understand the international question you had to be right on this you had to know the correct uh, the correct line as uh, as uh, determined by five really smart people in some some room somewhere, and really started listening in Chicago uh, when you know most of us are very familiar with the one of the best movies uh, uh, ever, the Blues Brothers, which is one of the best anti-fascist movies, which we all all claim they were parroting very real uh, fascist mobilizations during that time, where you know fascists would put flyer flyers up. With uh, with razor blades behind it, so they would if if anybody went to tear it down, tear down that fascist shit, they would get cut. So they would make the the removal of, of fascist graffiti into a collective effort. Let's go do this together. Let's go do this safely, and it created a, a sense of, uh, of of safety and camaraderie where they were able to build a really really large coalitions in uh, in Chicago. Uh, you know, crossing, you know, br bringing in the faith commu community, bringing in local local neighborhood groups, and said, let's uh, let's work together. And that's really when you saw the John Brown Anti Klan Committee really uh, finding an audience for their uh, for their ideas, having having conversations, and being uh, being extremely effective. And if anybody here is familiar with uh, with the uptown neighborhood in Chicago, that has been one of the most contested neighborhoods for organized white supremacy. You know, the previous generation of radicals, uh, the Young Patriots organization, Rising Up Angry, groups like that really uh, in the six, 60s and into the 70s, uh, you know, put a lot of effort into uh, reaching uh, white youth in that, in, in that area, but by, by, the, by the 80s, you had all sorts of, um, you, you know, all sor sorts of nat national front and other groups um, again gaining uh, gaining ground there. So the wor the coalition work of the John Brown Anti Klan Committee 
the cultural work of the John Brown Ant Anti-Klan Committee were as important as any flashy uh, piece of uh, violence that, uh, that is normally associated with that. So with that, I'm gonna shut up and uh, we'll have uh, three bald guys here for your, uh, for your questions and answers. And uh, thank, thanks, thanks Mark. Thanks Mark for, uh, Mark's work is you know certainly one of the high marks at, uh, in anti-fascist accessible literature, and I'm really glad to show the stage with all y'all. I'd like to take the prerogative as chair to ask a question first. Yeah, yeah. We do have students here. Students have a question, and anybody who obviously looks like a student, will do. Will do. Yeah. So if you just excuse me a moment, I'm. I don't mean to. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was great. Um, my first um, question is really, I think, primarily for Nigel, but also for Stanislav. So. Um, it's really interesting to think of the ways that fascism has historically stolen things from leftist discourse, from liberal discourse, and that's been the case since the beginning, right, as we're all aware. But you point to really interesting ways after World War II in particular and in the last decade or so that the far right has attempted to sort of um, mask their politics in, in various kinds of liberatory discourses as you discuss. So, you talk about that necessitates a different form of resistance among anti-fascists, and, and, and that makes perfect sense. I'm curious, either within recent years or historically, if there have been examples that you could point to to say, like, yeah, that's a good idea, that's promising. Um, wh what are some examples we can draw from? And then the, the second part of the question that is more pertains to Stanislav and your presentation is that, um, wh where does that leave militant anti-fascism, right? And Usually when we talk about how to confront a far-right formation that becomes popular, the conversation shifts to elections because it becomes a question of parliament. So where does that leave anarchist militant anti-fascists who reject that mode of struggle? Uh, does their politics become irrelevant? Is there a different way to move forward? So I guess either of you could go first, but. Do you, you want to go first, Taz, or? You, you go first. I go first. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. it's kind of a bit sort of harder for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a great, great uh, question, up, Mark. I think um, thinking back through the history, the recent history of uh, the anti-fascist movement in Britain, one of the one of the key challenges it faced, of course, was to transition from a uh, street-based militant practice. Um, in the 1990s to trying to uh, confront and engage with a far right that had, uh, in inverted commas, modernized. And in doing, in, and in terms of this modernization, what this meant was that it, um, it, it distanced itself from um, biological uh, racism and also from uh, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. What it did was to appropriate the kind of pseudo, if we want to call it that, pseudo-liberal discourse of uh, the French New Right, the Nouvelle Droite, which I think has been very important in terms of encouraging this adoption of uh, kind of libertarian uh, language and using it as a, stra a strategy of inversion. So what you see then in Britain is the emergence of a political party, the British National Party, that adopts this sort of language, um, uh, kind of pseudo-liberal language, and then requires a response. It had abandoned the streets, so what do you do? Well, what anti-fascists did, and I think they did very successfully in Britain, was to engage in a significant electoral intervention. 
And that electoral intervention meant um, knocking on doors, holding conversations on doorsteps with voters, uh, and trying to, in various ways, and using different technology and so on, to encourage the widest possible uh, uh, anti-racist vote uh, that they could. And so what we see in Britain is that over the course of a number of years, the British National Party begins to be affected by this in that the mobilization of the anti-racist vote is sufficient to push back. So that's one strategy where you can see it working in a, in a kind of imaginative way. Yeah, sure. Stas? Yeah, so in thinking about this more from like a, a North American perspective, like one of the challenges has been obviously that fascism in especially the United States context and, and certainly in the Canadian one too where you know we think about like the convoys is that it frames itself as libertarianism right it frames itself as individual freedom and, and in my book I talk about this as individual freedom to assert authority over others as a kind of like authoritarianism twisted into libertarianism uh, and that's presented a really serious challenge for anti-fascists that I don't think think they've taken on theoretically and, and certainly not practically in terms of like campaigning getting people to understand that like when these people talk about freedom they're not talking about freedom for everyone they're talking about freedom for them to oppress others and so that's that's been problematic uh, but one of the things that anti-fascists have done is following in that kind of fine tradition of uh, organizing is building mass mobilization. You know, the, this is one of those things that has been relatively successful in the, certainly in the United States context, is building these mass mobilizations. So to speak to kind of your second question a little bit more uh, and thinking about how mass mobilization, particularly when anti-fascism does become subsumed under this kind of electoralism. I mean, let's face it, Joe Biden ran a campaign that began by appropriating anti-fascist imagery from the, the clashes at Unite the Right. Like, you know, that was his first campaign ad. He announced his campaign basically by saying, like, I'm the anti-fascist candidate, <laughs> you know? So, and I don't know that anyone believes it besides maybe Joe Biden, um, but <laughs> like, yeah, but, but in, in any case, like there is this kind of push that electoralism is the, the path to anti-fascism and the space, uh, I think that the space that more radical and, and certainly anti-authoritarians have taken is a turn towards pragmatic activism where you see and we certainly saw this uh in that period that, that sort of contested period of, of the trump years where you have anti-authoritarian mutual aid projects and you had the, the, this sort of positive spin stories where it was like antifa are organizing to like you know help victims of various natural disasters and things of that nature and, and so in those mutual aid projects there is a kind of bottom-up building of anti-fascism that I think also speaks theoretically to some of the things that, that I'm talking about in terms of that ability to, of use of force, is that when you're building like bottom-up community mutual aid, that mutual aid translates into defense as well. And, and certainly like Scott Crow documented how that occurred in the sort of post-Hurricane Katrina uh, period. Great, okay, let's open it up. Go, for, go ahead. Uh, hi, so my name is Paul. I'm a, a PhD candidate, and I uh, specialize in populism, not fascism. And I think populist scholars have a kind of a clear conception of, you know, who's populist or not, who's a left populist, who's a right populist. Um, I think what I'm fuzzy on is what, where do you draw the line between a far right populist or a radical right party versus, you know, a fascist or a fascist party. So if you could just clarify, uh, anybody. So, um, up there, uh, it's kind of what, where do you draw the line between far right populist and fascist? Thank you. Who would like to jump in? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could answer that from a 
personal? Do you want a personal perspective on it or a <laughs> movement <laughs> perspective? Sorry? Any perspective. Any perspective. Um, I suppose where, I, where I, I come from it in terms of approaching uh, fa fascism as an ideology, um, as an ideology based on um, revolutionary ultranationalism, uh, that desire for the creation of a, a kind of post-liberal, radical new order, revolutionary new order. Um, I mean, Roger Griffin, of course, talks about this in terms of palingenesis uh, rebirth, national rebirth, ultranationalist rebirth. So uh, in relation to fascism, I approach it that way in terms of an ideology. Um, radical right populism, certainly as a kind of political scientists would, would approach it, would be that there is this clear distinction between that and fascism, as radical right populists are, are not revolutionaries. You know, they, they, they may be critical of some aspects of liberal democracy, but they don't necessarily want to overthrow it in toto. They don't want a complete over overthrow of it. My own perspective on this is that um, it kind of, it, it, the, that clear demarcation doesn't really exist in practice. In, in reality, it's a, it's a, the lines between the two are, are more fuzzy, uh, that they bleed into one another. Um, and this becomes difficult. And I think from an anti-fascist perspective, the way to look at this is to think about uh, radical right populism offering s safe space uh, for uh, more, uh, if you like, fascistic or you know harder uh, right-wing extremist e elements to uh, to circulate and disseminate. So that the concern there is in terms of radicalization. So, so the idea of safe space, I think, works quite quite effectively, and that should give grounds for challenging radical right populism on that basis. I would, I would add really quickly that John Brown Anti-Klan Committee kind of grappled with that, that question in a different way when they, they coined the term the Nazification of the Klan to, to say that, yeah, there, uh, you know, the populist right and the Klan, Klan right weren't always fascist, right? And they were very, very, um, very happy to work within the, the United States electoral system uh, for a long, uh, for a long time, and then there was there was a, tra a transition where the um, where, where the where the Klan largely became uh, be became fascist, and I think that's that's kind of the biggest through line to today's uh, today's conditions. And one more thing is that sometimes if you read the leaked the leaked chats of some of the right populist groups and what they're saying behind the scenes, then you <laughs> you get a much uh, fuller picture. <laughs> um, next question. Thank you for each of your presentations. Um, I wasn't able to squeeze my question into during the last Q&A session, so perhaps I'm hoping that maybe one of you on the panel right now could help me understand something that all connects together. Um, I'm gonna start with, my qu with the question that I'd like to be answered, but then if you don't mind, I'd like to explain a few um, uh, details. My question is, where have we been, meaning Americans, um, Gen X with a very decent education, but um, where have we been with the term Antifa? Where have we been with the ideals uh, behind Antifa? Um, full disclosure. It was on my radar during the beginning of the, I don't even like to say, but during the beginning of Trump's campaign and pr presidency, it seemed like we were almost divided into either feeding into what was either uh, Black Lives Matter or Antifa, or Black Lives Matter against Antifa. That was how it was presented on my radar. Now, I don't imagine that's how it happened, but where were the average Americans that I consider myself um, when even just the name, uh, the word, the terminology, and then we could get to the ideals because we were very convinced that it was an opposition to Black Lives Matter, and I don't know that that's really the extent of it. So uh, I think it ties into both the earlier presentation and also um, now, if you don't mind. Thank you. Should I do this? Yeah. Do it. yeah all right. Yeah, because I'm actually doing a little bit of a research project around some of this stuff uh, right now. Um, so 
I think th there's a lot there to, to think about. Uh, first of all, in terms of the actual like terminology of Antifa, th there's a history of that coming into use by anti-fascists in the United States. So prior to the early aughts, uh, most anti-fascist activism, uh, and what I call the, con the contemporary era of anti-fascist activism, was under the banner of anti-racist activism. And, and I think this also goes back to like that uh, legacy of the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and, and uh, other prior activism. So for the most part, at least since in, in like that interwar era, so from you know the the the, the period sort of around World War II to about the early aughts, it was anti-racist activism. Uh, still anti-fascist in, in the same kinds of traditions that you see you know, in Europe, uh, certainly in, in other places. So it was generally referred to as anti-racist activism. And, and this was partially conscious, at least in the 1980s and 90s when anti-racist action begins as an organization, it was a conscious decision by the people who started it. They modeled it after anti-fascist action. Uh, but they didn't want to use that terminology because in the United States context, people didn't really get it. They, they were like, you know, well, what, what is anti-fascism? Like, it's, it's the United States, we're a liberal democracy, right? So they chose anti-racist action because people got what that meant and they understood what that meant in, in a U.S. historical context. So a Antifa and, and the use of the, the name anti-fascist by those types of activists uh, comes about partially because of one of the critiques of the, the anti-racist action organization was that they're taking on these kind of marginalized, you know, like extreme racist organizations, but they weren't necessarily confronting structural or systemic racism. And so increasingly, uh, people who were doing that activism were switched and, and started saying like we're anti-fascist activists, we're, we're taking on specifically like fascist groups. Uh, and that's where that terminology comes in. So to bring it to today, to, to give you that, that kind of context, uh, a lot of it had to do with media framing. So a lot of, so what was happening is a lot of this activism it, what, and, and I talk about this in my book and sort of talked about it a little bit in my presentation, a lot of this activism was happening and still happens underground. It happens outside of the sphere of most people's everyday lives. Like chances are a good portion of people in this room have probably never been in a social or cultural space where there were fascists, you know? It, that's just, that's the way that a lot of people live their lives. Uh, so this was happening underground and happening underground under these kind of labels of anti-racist action, anti-fascist, uh, things of that nature. And then 2015-16 happened, right? The, the Trump campaign happened and fascists saw in Trump that avatar of their ideology, you know, even though most of them hated the guy, you know, disagreed hated him, thought of him as just like another globalist and all of the other aspects of it. But they saw him as a means to, a, to that end. And so they mobilized in the streets and the anti-fascist activists, because anti-fascism, I, I refer to it as a pure counter movement. It exists solely because fascism exists. And so the, the, the fascists came up from the underground and the anti-fascists came up from the underground to confront them. And so that's where that terminology becomes commonplace. And there was the, the, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, I know I said it relatively quickly, there was this conflation of anti-fascism with any kind of protest violence. So what happens in the course of the racial justice protests of 2020 is that you have in right-wing media this kind of intentional conflation of like Antifa and rioting and rioting being you know, sort of de detracting from the larger racial justice protests and, and the calls for, like, and, and certainly the, the calls for and, and the meaningful Black Lives Matter kind of protests. And that's, that's where I think you get that kind of pitting of like Antifa versus Black Lives Matter, when none of this was the reality that was happening in the streets. First of all, like 95% of those protests had no incidents of m even minor property destruction of the ones that did have, you know, empirical of it research found that of the ones that did have violence, it was either uh, largely the outcome of police aggression towards protesters, um, and then that pr police aggression towards protesters led to counter aggression, which then 
turned into rioting for the most part. But the narrative, and it was a right-wing narrative designed to scare the general population and, and a, as I, I talk about in some places, to intentionally delegitimize anti-fascism. You know, it was intentionally designed to scare people to delegitimize anti-fascism and to draw wedges between people who had, uh, you know, potential ideological alliances. You know, one of the things that, that I talked about for like the last five or six years, you know, in various interviews, is that like, yeah, there are Antifa activists at Black Lives Matter demonstrations, but they're not there as Antifa activists. They're there as racial justice activists because anti-fascist activists are racial justice activists because anti-fascist activists are you know activists for economic justice and activists for justice around issues of gender equality and sexual orientation and, and all any number of progressive causes, but the anti-fascism is a specific kind of activ activism that's done because there's that threat of fascism. I hope that makes sense. Can I just, yeah. I'll just, can I just come in there yeah, go right ahead. quickly to yeah, say yeah. something about Britain, which is kind of, I'll just put this in because it's quite interesting. In terms of the t terminology of Antifa, it wasn't uh, widely adopted in Britain. It hasn't been widely adopted in Britain. Uh, talking to an anti-fascist uh, there, they think the word is kind of what does it mean? It's it's kind of could it could it be a type of pasta, pasta, right? <laughs> <laughs> or somewhere you might go for a, a stag do, which is a bachelor party. You know, you might go abroad to anti. <laughs> so um, it's it's not widely. I mean, there was an attempt in the noughties to adopt it in Britain, and it's taken from Germany. You know, the German continental example, it was kind of, we tried, tried to import it into Britain, but it just didn't resonate. And it still doesn't, because people don't really know what it means in the UK. I mean, it's become more kindly acknowledged since what's happened here in the US, yeah. but not in Britain. One little thing on that, I just sorry, this is a big topic that people are thinking about, is that I think also the media has coded Antifa as white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I don't think that there is really empirical evidence for because the identities of a lot of people that do this work are just unknown. There isn't the data to say that to affirm or deny that, but that's definitely part of it. And I think it's interesting that you associated them as being antithetical because for the right wing media, there's the BLM hyphen Antifa is <laughs> the uh, scary left that they want to associate the Democrats with. Okay, let's move it along. Um, so my question is prompted by the second presentation and how uh, the use of violence has become so normalized within Antifa. Um, tolerance is built into that movement as well as built into most of the left's ideology. Um, so I was just wondering what your thoughts are on kind of the implication that in order to be tolerant, you need to have some level of intolerance. Um, and I think that's where Antifa justifies okay. that use of violence, but how do you think it affects their credibility or their validity as a social movement working towards tolerance? Yeah, well, I would say to some extent the, the concept of tolerance itself is actually counterproductive, you know, and counterproductive to uh, both anti-fascist struggles and struggles for uh, for any kind of like social justice that we're thinking about. Uh, because the, the concept of tolerance, and there's a history to that, right? It, it develops in a, in a particular kind of social and political context, which is like the kind of liberal consensus of the Cold War era, where there was this idea that like the white majority needs to tolerate the existence of people of color and needs to tolerate, you know, right? Like the, the, the heterosexual majority has to tolerate the existence of LGBTQ plus people, right? Like, so the, the concept itself is, is sort of conceptually problematic. Um, and, and so for, for most people who are taking particularly a more radical kind of position that anti-fascists espouse is not about tolerance, it's about creating a society of equality, right? And when we think about like the processes for creating that society of equality, the position then the position of anti-fascist becomes how do we do that when there is an element in that in this society who want to maintain that inequality, but not just maintain that inequality in structural or systemic ways, we, which we can attribute to kind of the mainstream right in, in the United States, or at least the old sort of mainstream right in and the left. United States, right? Like the, the Republican Party of old was like, you know, well, you know, we'll, we'll just pass a bunch of policies that essentially like 
make this stuff you know part of our but now you have this right that virulently and openly is eliminationist right you know that that's that anti-fascist component is that it, it's openly eliminationist you can't confront an eliminationist force that views violence as not just a means to an end but the end in itself that, that views people who use violence as like inherently superior human beings right you can't confront that with nonviolence. like if you sit down in front of them they're like great smash right like it doesn't work and so this is where you have you have to have a strategically effective means of confronting that you know and an element of that strategic effectiveness is going to be some sort of counter force. This is why you, I use the term force more often than I use violence I, in talking about these things, is that there has to be a counter force. And that counter force, when, when it works effectively, can be done in a quote unquote nonviolent manner. It, you know, if you have enough of a mass mobilization that it effectively like disarms a fascist threat, that that's great. But when, that's not necessarily effective or when that fascist threat is willing to use violence against that overwhelming counterforce you know again great case examples that came especially like to you know portland because it has been sort of the epicenter for so many of these clashes it, you know you had these mass mobilizations where the people from the far right came specifically to fight with whoever they could come in contact with right you know there has to be some sort of protective force. And what we've seen, you know, as I pointed out, what we've seen is that we can't rely on the state and we can't rely on those institutions. And to some extent, the people who are engaging in the, that counterforce are also basically ideologically oriented towards constructing something different, right? prefiguring a different kind of politics. And, and so that also comes into the way in which they build their defensive capacities. You know, and we can talk about it more after, sorry. <laughs> Maybe, could we hear both and then respond and then that's it or is that a little push in it? All right, so let's just, uh, I'm sorry then, one more question. Okay, all right, just oh, maybe then we'll hear both and respond to both then, okay. Okay, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll try to be quick. My name is Chris Erickson, I'm a guidance counselor and social studies teacher at high school. Um, I just, first of all, thanks everyone, thanks Hofstra. Um, Nigel, I felt that your portraying of the trucker protests was a little broad and disingenuous. Many of those truckers were working class men and women who, because of the lockdown, lost their income and as a result still were paying the loan on the truck. These are individual, like small businesses. So yes, within that were there some. I think there was one Confederate flag, nothing like they tried to portray it. I think that was, comp it was presented as if this was a right wing rally when in reality there was the First Nations people of Canada were fully in support of that trucker protest. So I think that was a little bit broad. And then to follow it with Stannis is the idea that go punch a, a Nazi is the answer. So now we're saying the working class is the enemy and punch them before they punch you. I think it can create the juxtaposition of those two presentations together is a little bit it's a little bit scary, to be honest with you. And I think Stannis just wanted to say the um, the only good Nazi is a dead Nazi. That that comes from this very racist uh, quote against indigenous people of the United States, uh, where the settler colonialists were the only good engine is a dead engine, and the idea was to kill any Native American you saw. So to use that, and then like a Captain America, it just it's just kind of. Weird, And then I would just say my quick question is Fred Hampton, the reason why he was such a threat was that he brought together poor working class whites and blacks in Chicago and was saying there needs to be dialogue and, 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 and people of color. And that's why he was the threat. And I think the idea that we don't talk, we punch, we don't talk, we hit with a bat. You know, and then the early morning's talking about the hooligans with the bats. What's the difference if we're saying, yeah, hit and punch, don't talk? When Fred Hampton would say, especially towards the end when he became a real dangerous character, they said, no, he, he's too dangerous because he's bringing together the the white and the black and the people and the Puerto Rican all with legitimate grievances to the structure. Thank you for that. Next question. 
this is kind of funny because my thing's almost the exact opposite as the last <laughs> one. Um, do you, you want to just answer the question? No, no I'm just kidding. Yeah, Go ahead. It is in, in its own <laughs> yeah, sense. So I was in Ottawa in 2018 is when I left. So I wasn't there for the Freedom Convoy, but I have comrades there that were into this. And Nigel, you didn't really draw any conclusions about this. And I think that really speaks to where they, they kind of landed on it is the anti-fascist organizing was really in disarray. If you were looking more at the anti-Islamic stuff, I was just going to suggest that when I was there and do know people in OAF before it went defunct is that there were a couple things that were really interesting about countering the anti-Islamic discourse. And one of them was a lot of people that were involved in OAF were also involved in um, First Nations organizing. So a lot of those people, and well, I don't want to tell too many stories out of school, but a lot of those <laughs> people also did like the Reoccupy 2017 and stuff like this. Um, and to, to counter the thing about the convoy is that it fits in the same thing. You can't say First Nations supported it because First Nations, Métis and, and Inuit people are a gigantic diverse group of uh, sovereign nations and they all have different takes on this kind of thing. So to present it as they all were in it is, is too much because... We, we, but, but we, the, we, we're, be, we're getting the, yeah, we're but getting the, the but thing, I, so just... I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah. Is, is one of the ways that makes it important what OAF was doing and what they were looking at, and then it reflects in some of my work because I was involved in that stuff, is that it was to push these right-wing movements by the left going into direct organizing with indigenous people for indigenous rights, land back, um, sovereignty movements and stuff, and it really reveals a lot of these movements as racist and right wing when they want to throw their lot in with more oil, drill for some more shit, forget about indigenous rights, because this is advancing the settler colonial project. And so if you kind of push it back if you're looking in Ottawa and in Toronto um, for those things, is you'll find some of that stuff, um, not necessarily through the RCP, RCP part, but you'll find some of that stuff, and I think that's a really good um, thing that some of those groups were doing, even though now they're defunct and many of them don't talk to each other. Anyway, thanks. Okay. Um, do you want to just say like one word, one sentence a piece, or you got nothing to say, or because they're really they're getting me to? I, I'll, I'll yeah. say something on the Fred Hampton question. I spent ten years researching the original Rainbow Coalition that you referenced. I I'm totally with you about the uh, about the part of talking, but Fred Hampton. And the Panthers that I spent spent many years uh, researching would never ever give away uh, the right to to self defense. Okay, absolutely not. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's on it. Yep. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. We yeah. 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 Yeah.